Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Tammy, you look like you're joining from somewhere where it might still be very dark out. It, it is dark. It's we're in Honolulu for we're in Hawaii for indoor air. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so it's dark. I remember going to Hawaii in the first couple of days out there. It was like because of the jet lag, waking up at three o'clock in the morning or four uh -huh. o'clock in the morning, not being able to sleep. Yeah, no, we've been here a week. Mm. It started on Sunday, so I'm not jet lagged anymore. I'm still on pretty early schedule. And there's roosters, which is nice. I like roosters. And Narisma looks like he's joining you in Hawaii too. He is, but it's so now it's right there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hey. Good morning. Good Where are you? morning, Yasa? afternoon. I'm at Yasa in, your, uh, in Austria. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so you're Five. late. It's Friday night. At 5 p.m., I got to go rush, you know, for partying, partying in Austria. <laughs> go party quick, quick. <laughs> Hurry, party. <laughs> Um, gonna maybe wait a couple minute more minutes to see who else shows up. I um, we don't have anything on the schedule. I have a huge number of things to talk about, but I wanted to give other people a chance to get things they want to talk about on the schedule. For me, a lot of things arose and just didn't get dealt with while we were in craziness, um, and so. I don't know if the same thing happened to anyone else because I kept saying, oh, we'll deal with that, you know, when the thing is over, right? <laughs> and yeah. So, um, I am going to put the call schedule link in the chat. So, is there anything else that people have been thinking about? Wanting to talk about? New? Well, I have... Um, Good. I, I just, it's, it's kind of an invitation. The University of Illinois has started a climate jobs institute that is really interested in um, the transition to electrification, and they are funded by the state of Illinois to produce reports mainly about um, electrification and heat pump transition and EV transition in Illinois. Um, I would be really interested in having members of this team talk to folks at the Climate Jobs Institute to just maybe talk more about what this project is and what it has been and what has been learned or if there are any methods or processes that would fit um, and see if there's any interest in collaboration um, for, for some of the future work that, that might be being done in Illinois. I, it's very nebulous right now. I have, I'm asking people for mm -hmm. any more like details, but I think that there could be some overlap and interesting research avenues that this group could be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, are, are, is CDAC involved with it? CDAC, are, are... Yep. CDAC's getting involved. So it's just still kind of spinning up and people are figuring out what they're doing right now. Is that they're, where it is? Yeah. Yeah. Figuring out what they're doing. 
um, trying to figure out who the partners are um, Mm -hmm. and what expertise is is either missing or still needed. Um, I think probably hearing, yeah, hearing from this group would be really beneficial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, or not the whole group. That? <laughs> that would be a lot. <laughs> what would that look like to engage with them? Is it like you you writing an invitation to um to whoever's like, leading? To you? Just have an exploratory conversation. Okay. Well, tell us more about what you think it needs uh, needs to happen. You don't have to tell us now, but I think anyone else want to comment on that? I keep seeing Chris sending balloons. I am seeing Chris sending balloons. Are you sending balloons? <laughs> am I sending balloons? Uh-huh. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom uh, interpreting gesticulation in some way. Yeah, it's I mean, gonna, it, it's gonna be a thumbs up. Does it show up? I don't I'm know. Doing it this. Am I still doing it? No, no oh. I, I saw it twice. Well, I apologize for the balloons. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure what you I did. Didn't apologize for balloons, <laughs> <laughs> Stacy. I will say, I um, Aaron Rose was here at this conference. Oh. And we should uh, the the thing that we've been talking about about how to engage people. Mm-hmm. I think it, it would be nice to loop Erin back into the conversation. Okay. I think uh, Three Cubed, her organization, is doing one of the best jobs I've seen of community engagement, um, and like really actually working with people to figure out what they want and what they value okay we we attended a um a session on community engaged research and so i was hoping to learn things and instead i left really grumpy (laughs) because it was (laughs) i'm starting to see a pattern where um it's like people call you and they're like you should not you know you you really need to change your ways. And then they act exactly like they're, they're expecting you not to. Like everybody in this room has no experience with any kind of community engaged research, right? Let me tell you what to do. I'm the expert. <laughs> this is exactly what we're not supposed to do, right? <laughs> and so, um, and so they, and, and then here, comment on our rubric that we've developed for what is good community engaged research. And it felt, I, I'm just starting to feel this way, like, wow, this is what it's like to be a community member who isn't consulted, right? <laughs> so anyway, I thought Aaron had some really good thoughts uh, that that kind of tie into our, like the community should she didn't say this. This is how I interpreted it. And I interpret it through my lens. The community community members of different types should not necessarily define the research, but be able to have latitude over how they want to engage. And then the research team needs to ensure that they're engaged in that way and check with them in a way allows them to say that it's working or not working so that it can be nudged. But that doesn't mean that like the little circle that was in that diagram, it, it's almost like people say the best thing is that the community reads the leads the research. And sometimes that's not what they want to do. Right? But it doesn't mean you should disregard how they want to be engaged. Okay, so that's that's a thing, a permanent thing for me is figuring that out. And then what does it look like to figure it out? Right. Then are you the expert? So anyway, that's on my mind. Sorry, I said I was going to let you talk about things you want to do. 
just non sequitur but erin rose and i uh, and she's kind of working with nrel and us in supporting fusion acs you know that i did i tell you that so they yes, are i engaged about fusion i didn't know what it looked that looked like yeah because they're working on providing energy burden estimates uh at the county mm -hmm. at the track level and then they found out about and they're just using SES and they found out about fusion SES and they wanted us to use Rex 2020 data to generate energy burden estimates. So we're doing that. It's not supported financially by them, but she's the contact for it. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Mm. All, the, all the different connections. Mm. I also wanted to mention that I'm here at Yasa, what the one of the developers, the developer of the bench agent based model. Yep. Is, mm -hmm. is here and so if Raidul has any interest or questions that I that he wants me to do direct to her, I, I'm supposed to meet her for lunch and talk about it. So just want to, I, I was going to ask Raidul in this call, but he's not here, so I can send him an email. But just I wanted to let you know. Yeah, he might um, still be in Bangladesh. Oh, he's in Bangladesh. Okay. Yeah, I think he he and I were returning about the same time, so he didn't mark out, but. Um, I would love to talk to her too, because I think you know about my ambitions for making models a little more transparent, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and I, 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 I get the sense, I'm, I don't know her at all, but I get the sense that she would be open to that, right? Like, we just want yeah. energy models to be better and accessible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want, I can. I'm not sure the timing will work out, but um, at least I can speak to her on your behalf on that topic. Um, but I'll try and set up a meeting and see if it's. It'll have to be in the afternoon. Yeah, I'll try and set it up. See yeah, we can go earlier too. Right. We yeah. we can do an early morning meeting. Yeah, so what's your schedule like next week? Horrible. Um, Morn mornings? So, hold on, I'm looking at it. Um, <clears throat> next week is pretty ugly. Oh. Uh, is, are you, are you there only? Yeah, I'm Monday as well. The following Monday is the only day. 22nd July is my last day here. Following so, Monday, yeah, no. Um, Thursday morning would be the only time for me. Okay, I'll ask her. And even okay. then, I, so I'm booked starting at 9 hour, that's mountain time. But I could you go could do earlier. I could do earlier. Let's see how much Raidul will tolerate. Oh, yeah, um, eight o'clock mountain is 10 plus six, 4 p.m. That's that should be okay over here. Yeah, and I can do, I can do six or seven, and I don't, I don't know what Raidul will tolerate. Okay, I'll ask her if she's free on Thursday afternoon. Yeah, no, but I, I think it's time to start the conversation about what does it look like to have a transparent model. Yeah, um, yeah. I think right dual said like <clears throat> head down coding. Um, but I'm gonna start bothering him and annoying him. You know, when you're coding, you just want to get it done. Um, mm -hmm. but my experience in developing spew or hab trend along with um like trying to do it alongside Ray Dual, I was like, oh, here's how we should do it. And I, I don't know why I couldn't do that without actually doing the work, but I felt like that that brought home to me what was valuable about the abm model and yet why people or what things that i would like to see nudged for abm mm -hmm. yeah 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 she was um there so there was a, a aspen global change conference yeah. that mm -hmm. had a lot of the scenario developers there mm -hmm. and she went to that and so in our conversation about creating an, an Aspen event, I would like to have her again. Because mm. I think, okay. yeah, anyway, so definitely okay. good to connect with her.
Great. Um, I'm going to drop off in a minute. Uh, so obviously we don't know, we have no idea when we're going mm. to get back. They said few weeks, few weeks, couple mm. have passed. So mm -hmm. we're just in waiting mode. Um, okay. So can I, if you have two minutes to give your thoughts on this question, one thing that has struck me is that we've done a really good job um, with heterogeneity and identifying some of the characteristics of, of under-resourced populations, et cetera, through CARTIX data on a national scale when we don't actually have to talk to them, right? <laughs> like we can get their data, but in the interviews, because of the ways that we, because of how we access them and, and whoever responded, we're, we're not getting there yet. And so I just wanted to be really open about what do we not know yet? Who have we not talked to? Then we can begin figuring out who to talk to. So you can give your thoughts, Narasimha, since you have to run away and go party. Um, and then On who we need to talk to in phase, if we have a phase two? Yeah, like the kind of interviews that Chris did were, I think Chris, and, and I may have paraphrased you wrong, but you felt like you were kind of hearing the same things again and again, which is a good place to stop interviewing. But possibly you were hearing the same things because you were talking to a certain group of people. So like, it, do we need to talk to people who are... We, we and we heard about heat stress from your people. Do we need to talk to other people who would respond differently to heat stress or the same? Right? Like, I'm not confident that those people represent everyone. We're just confident that we're not hearing different things anymore. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, also geography was limited and they have certain experience that is similar with regards to uh, climatic conditions as well as what are conventions with how you deal with climate. So the swamp cooler phenomenon, I don't think is widespread. It, there are probably many places where it does exist, but in a lot of places that it doesn't. Because um, it's suitable for dry heat and not for human heat, for, for, for instance. So I do think that the approach, this is what we talked about, you know, with Ryan, the approach of sampling uh, that Chris and Ryan did for Chris's interviews, I would love to scale up and um, to the extent we can go national, but identifying those who did seek a permit to make a modification, or if we can identify another way to know that they made a mod that they changed their system uh, because I don't know how many different answers we could possibly get, right? We don't know the extent of heterogeneity that's out there. So the only way to tackle that to me is as large a sample as possible, or at least strategic sampling across different parts of the country. We do know from Christina's work and the data in the last few years of who has acquired heat pumps, they're mostly located in particular regions, you know, so Phoenix, Miami, LA, Detroit, Chicago, uh, DC, in, in order, in decreasing order of prevalence. So we could do strategic sampling in certain metropolitan areas, um, but I think we'd like I'd like to go national and I'd like to find a creative way to identify people who have just recently gotten new equipment for heating and cooling. That's what I think. And then we'll uncover, hopefully, the extent of heterogeneity or not. Um, another point is, a, which, we're, which is strategic, where we, we seem to now focus on cooling equipment, driving heating equipment change decisions. So we could also just focus on that aspect, you know, just people who, not just looking at the end of life of heating equipment, but of ACs. So mm -hmm. finding out about ACs and when they're replaced, um, that could be another angle to sample as well. If we want to build on the heat, heat stress hypothesis, which is not, which is an additional factor that other people haven't looked at very much. Mm -hmm. So well, there are multiple approaches I think I would be interested to at least explore. 
Chris, did you, um, when you did your calls, was it, was it just all the permits and you didn't distinguish between equipment? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And so Ryan did some interesting things with um, income and, or with, yeah, Ryan, Ryan did the analysis of who was using what contractors. Um, and so there was some demographic diversity in that database. How did that correspond to the people you interviewed? Did you cover the same like low to high income that the data did or did you get a difference in response? I, quite honestly, with the interviews, um, there isn't um, much um, in the data when it comes to socioeconomic status. I mean, we had some participants who, um, you know, certainly would have taken on more of an economic burden than um, others in making a change. But mm -hmm. but I think Ryan's data also captured people that um, more or less had to probably seek out or did have to seek out um, uh, assistance uh, through various local programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I know he made some interesting findings in regard to that, but we didn't, we weren't able to interview people uh, yet at least that uh, were participants in those programs. It, right. So do you think you would have, was that part of your question? Would you have I, known I, those I individuals? Have, I definitely would have liked to um, have interviewed them. Um, in the last batch of addresses that he provided before we decided to uh, pause, um, on the interviews, that last batch did include some addresses where it was fairly clear. I think he could speak better to this than I could, but mm -hmm. it, um, my impression was that uh, some of those uh, addresses were houses that uh, received assistance. Um, and the f most of the uh, um, initial addresses didn't include them yeah yeah so you can tell by address or it's just like a part of town or I'm what, not, what's your, how do you yeah, look I'm at not, that know I'm not what... positive about that I, I it, mm -hmm. Ryan um somehow in the data I think there's if I remember right the I think the data indicates that uh that instead of going through a particular contractor, they went through, you know, let's say Pueblo Housing, and then Pueblo Housing mm. provided them with this contractor. I think the data tells him mm -hmm. that. There's a, okay, so there's a housing authority? Yeah, housing authority. I think so. And do they provide public housing? Or, or do they just provide housing assistance? How does that work in your area? I'm not positive about that. Okay. Um, just strikes me a note that Paul is in conversations with Pueblo Community College. To do you work with them at all, Chris? No. Or did you talk to Paul about that? They're they're trying to get uh, energy auditor training throughout the state of Colorado and Pueblo Community College is one of the places that would stand up. And I wonder if they would have some ideas. So I'm assuming that you just called people, right? You just called people and asked for interviews and some people responded and some people did not. You did not make any effort to target particular groups. It was just like you had a list and you're going down the list. That's right. Um, so what I'm, yeah, what I, 
worried about, I'm sure you know about, more about this than me, is that you get a bias in response that certain kind of people respond. Do you think that happened? Yeah, I mean, in particular, the the bias occurs in the sense that uh, most of the participants, you know, I, I'm sure, well, I know, you know, many of them took on debt to make that change, but uh, there are plenty of people who wouldn't even qualify, right, to take on that debt. So I would be interested in um, interviewing more people mm -hmm. that bought all those services because their choices um, uh, in equipment or or certainly the uh, who they uh, received the work from um, would differ a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of their choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then if there were people who could not, if as you say, qualify or afford to make that change, then they, of course, would not be represented in the permits. Mm -hmm. so... And unfortunately, nor would the people who don't even, aren't even aware of those programs right. deal with having really uncomfortable, uh, you know, environments and not knowing that they might have more options available to them to make a change. Mm hmm mm hmm yeah, so I think that sampling strategy is really clever, but I think we should maybe consider opening up more because I especially we we know we know there's always a sampling bias, and then I Kartik, is there anything in in your data or maybe Christina's data where we could match the kind of people that turned up in the sample? I guess Christina's approach is 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 very national, right? So she's just comparing outcomes at different points in the nation. Um, but I'm just wondering, is there a way to leverage your data to figure out how the respondents might be biased? You don't have heat pump change. I don't have heat pump change, but I mean, the data, some of the data that Brian was using is actually, is the ACS data because the income stuff he uses, he's just pulling stuff from the ACS, either block level or track level data to guide some of his thinking. Oh. So, I mean, what I could add to that is, you know, variables from other surveys. And you know, give Ryan a more more to play with, I guess, at that geographic level. But yeah, I think that's the extent to which I could see. Yeah, I see yeah, fusion ACS data contributing to this. Stacy, do you have thoughts on this? You must like you. I think you you see a lot of things from running the programs the 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 solar program that you're involved in to now you're going to become the Illinois Climate Jobs Act expert <laughs> but but you see a lot of these things do and I'm I'm sure you can see how sampling biases might happen in terms of response and being willing to connect and communicate do you have thoughts about how to access people who, who wouldn't answer a call about a survey or how to get people who would just not even be able to consider new equipment? So, I mean, I think the thing that I'm thinking of the most is like a boots on the ground approach. Um, I, I don't know yeah. that that is easy, that it's time intensive and mm -hmm. requires people. Um, there was a, a project in Southern Illinois that CDAC is part of, um, which has a major community outreach component and 
one of the one of the strategies that they did was like, okay, we're gonna have a meeting at the local school. We're gonna have all these people come. We're gonna tell people about energy efficiency and renewable energy. And they realized that everyone who showed up were people that they already knew and were interested in the subject. So mm -hmm. then what do you do? And, um, and they said, you know, what is going to work here in this community is that we need a door-to-door -door approach. And that is just so time intensive. And you can't show up on someone's door with a survey without something to offer, like a light bulb kit or, you know, some kind of energy saving measures and some kind of connection to someone in the community that's like, all right, you can trust these guys. Yeah. Um, or I, I know so-and-so. So that's what worked for this project in a very rural, small community where everyone knows everybody, but, you know, on a larger scale, um, I mean, I kind of feel like if you could do this sort of project and talk to people as they were, let's say, waiting in line for a LIHEAP application, but people are yeah. not in line thinking about, you know, like, it, that's not a calm moment either, but mm -hmm. it could be an interesting conversation. Usually people applying for LIHEAP are stressed because they can't pay their utility bill. And this is the only time this month that the application period is open. And now I'm going to have to wait in line with a hundred people, but like working is it an with in-person thing, LIHEAP? Mm -hmm. It used because, to be, I don't know if they changed their practices after the pandemic, but I used to be a LIHEAP case manager. And so we would have 15 minutes appointment face-to-face. -face. People have to go and wait in a waiting office and bring their documentation in. I I think it is still in person. That's crazy. So for those of you who don't know, LIHEAP is government assistance with energy bills. And I'm not really sure what the income qualification is, but it, it's the it is an entry point to certain kinds of government assistance, sometimes even to weatherization, like he makes referrals, but I think it doesn't, sometimes, it doesn't always happen yeah. doesn't state always. by state or something. No, sometimes like heat programs are not even run in the same office as the like weatherization agency office. They could be totally separate entities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think some states have tried to integrate it better knowing that like, okay, well, this would be a really good pipeline into weatherization. Um, and some states have done a really great job of like one-stop applications. So if you're applying for LIHEAP, that means that you have one application that's also going to go to weatherization. It's also going yeah. to go to other programs that you can qualify for. I'm sorry, that's not answering the original question. I no, think the it way is we're answering. R is <laughs> the key. Um, So do we, okay, a um, couple of questions. How did the door-to-door -door approach work? Did, was there then a wider reach? Even if it is not something we can consider, I would like to know what people have found that that works. I don't have the metrics on like how many doors were knocked and how many light bulbs were given away and what the nature of the conversations were. Y'all are such researchers. You want to know that data. I'm just like, oh yeah, well, they just, went and knocked on doors. <laughs> well, it so. could be like super qualitative. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, they still felt like they didn't have enough, but they had more. Or <laughs> yeah. It started to feel better. <laughs> um, and then another question is, uh, Chris, we had started to work with the the health department in Pueblo who had said that they could maybe assist with referrals and I've never pursued that or gone back to them after our first meeting because I felt like um I honestly I felt like they were really strapped right like there was one person doing everything relating to health in Pueblo Unlike Fort Collins, where you actually have three people working on indoor air quality and they're like, we don't have enough resources. And I'm like, oh man, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> did, were you in that meeting, Chris? 
I was teaching that day. Oh man, we, I should come back when. Um, but but I wonder if if there some kind of health access where you hear about heat stress, like the people don't go to the doctor for heat stress, right? But I don't know if the if there are community health programs where you might hear about that that kind of thing. But then you only hear about what people complain about, right? Which I guess, you know, if it, if it's rising to the point of taking action, then then we want to hear about it. Yeah, this is and this is very anecdotal here, but um our our daughter has a a, a friend who um she and her mom live in um an apartment uh in Pueblo itself and uh, they have a window air unit the landlord doesn't provide air conditioning um we've had some very hot days here recently where uh -huh. uh, the mom has just uh uh talked about just the relentless heat stress she um experiences but not feeling like she can do anything about it because in her mind it's totally in um the hands of the landlord and mm -hmm. so on a super hot day it's about uh, 85 degrees in her apartment and um never really gets cooler than that until uh, the evening and so i'm i would be really um interested in speaking to more people like her um she wasn't mm interview she just this was just more of a casual conversation uh -huh. that we had um but also speaking to different landlords and um learning more about uh about uh you know what kind of options they have if any um uh -huh. beyond just you know footing the bill for a air conditioning unit yeah. um but maybe that's off track here but um i'm just kind of thinking about the different people we haven't talked to yeah no maybe or maybe not and landlords are right notoriously difficult to access because they they might feel like they don't know what they can do and so they they put up a defensive sure. um Foster. At least that's what I hear from other things about housing quality and in, in the Healthy Housing Coalition. Um, but to your point, Chris, so I, I think one of the thoughts, uh, one thought is, do people take any kind of action when they are heat stressed, like, do they, I, maybe we could try to find people who have bought window air conditioners, right? Like maybe, maybe there's an in through like some kind of product that isn't the kind of product that, or right, people seek relief in some ways. I mean, I, I, I don't know, we find people buying extra towels or something. I don't, I don't know if that will work, but it is, is there a way that we can try to tap those, those individuals that are doing something for relief that is not uh, HVAC equipment? And then I keep, Kartik, I keep coming back to your data, right? I think you folks are making it finer and finer all the time. More data, finer scale, right? Um, but as you're, as you're doing this, are you, can you think of any way, so we're, we've been talking about people, 
but you have spatial heterogeneity. So would there be any way to identify pockets of people that have access to certain things and or or that have I, I don't actually know what all your variables are, but you see what I'm you see what I'm saying. Can we can mm -hmm. we leverage the the heterogeneity and the data? Maybe not at a national level because we don't have that kind of reach at this point, but maybe mm -hmm. within the state or identifying two places that should be similar in some way or or something. Oh yeah, def oh definitely. So Harrison is like send out the send out the troops nationwide, and I'm like okay, <laughs> one thing at a time. <laughs> let's let's make a step. <laughs> I mean, at this point, yeah, I mean, I can definitely make state level maps of where the energy dissatisfied people are mostly located and who they hmm. are in terms of, you know, the demographics, right? So that's fairly straightforward with the existing data already. So at, at least to make sure that we're matching the demographics or seeking to match the demographics and spa spatial and demographic information. Well, that should already be aligned because yeah, Ryan is using the ACS data to guide mm -hmm, some of his mm -hmm. demographic selections, right? So what I could do is just overlay that with either equipment choices or dissatisfaction numbers and give you county-wise breakdown of mm -hmm. you know, where the most dissatisfied are, where the least are, or which counties are similar in terms of dissatisfaction levels. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, what race or income levels are associated with that dissatisfaction. So you can definitely mm -hmm. do all of that. Again, preface all of this by saying that yeah, all of this is simulated data. So just kind of be a little aware of that. But in terms of broad trends, pretty sure you could use those as guiding. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, and then the question, yeah, then we have to figure out the access, right? Do we go, could we even consider the door-to-door? -door? Um, that seems hard. I also, Stacy, when when they did that door-to-door -door campaign, did they use members of the community that were already known? Or how did they, how did they make it so or did, did they give attention to whether the people would actually want to talk to the individuals who came by? Not sure. I'll be honest. I watched a video where they showed them like their workers knocking on doors <laughs> um, <laughs> as like a... <laughs> <laughs> as a, a video to submit for an energy prize to DOE. <laughs> so oh my gosh. I have this really cool video that I could share with the group, but uh -huh. I only have the information that's in it. I wasn't part of like the sampling strategy conversation. Yeah, the conversation about who would go and do the work. Um, but I have access to the people who were deeply involved. If you'd like to like invite a conversation, like I'm happy to ask these questions to to help learn more. Like uh -huh. what you know how many people went out to the community how did you ensure that the people knocking on doors were like trusted individuals how did you identify which homes to go to which blocks uh -huh. Uh -huh. this community has like 300 people living in I don't know how many actually live in the community but yeah so you could imagine very rural so they might have hit all three blocks and it was fine yeah 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 <laughs> it's very different than how that might work in Denver um Another thing, like I recently, so another, this is an ineffective strategy, completely ineffective. Um, and I think that like, it's good to learn from. I, my a CSA, which stands for like community supported agriculture, where I go and I pick up vegetables from a local farm every week. A lot of people are part of this. And so there's always a line at the pickup. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, the health department handed out some survey, but the health department wasn't there. So everyone at the CSA got this five page health related survey and was like, oh, here's this health survey. We'd like you to take it. But it had no information about, well, who do I return this to? Who is creating this survey? Where is this information going? It was so super weird. And they were like, oh yeah, it's just the health department. 
Okay. Huh. So let's not do that in, <laughs> like, in the have, city. Did they have a consent form? It had, it should have said. No. no. Don't you have to have a consent form? I'm only if you're a university, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <But> <laughs> So I, you know, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to turn this into, I tried to find it online. I couldn't find the survey online. I just, mm -hmm. I threw it away. But like, so we won't do that. But I thought that using the, you know, the audience of people who are showing up to pick up their vegetables is people who are right. different than folks who show up at the health department or at the food bank. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's a totally different demographic. That's going mm -hmm. to have a different set of, yeah, um, you know, needs and ideas about what is happening in the community because people that go to the health department don't have eight hundred dollars a year to spend on vegetables mm -hmm. or whatever. Anyway, so that was like that's one thing, and then farmers markets. So instead of going to door to door, having a farmers market booth could be something that's effective. Um, I don't know about farmers markets in Colorado, but the ones here have been trying to work a lot on equity. So people that have food stamps can go to a farmer's yeah. market and get their food stamps transferred into tokens that, you know, it's sort of democratized and everybody can use the tokens, but they do get two for one. So through mm. a program. So for every mm. dollar in food stamps that you have, you can get $2 in farmer's market food. So that, you know, stretches the dollars a little bit further, especially understanding that the farmer's market vegetables are a little bit more expensive yeah. um, and makes it so that more of a wide demographic of the community can enjoy this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, public marketplace. Ellison has done some farmer's market booth in the Denver area. We haven't done it in... I haven't seen anything done in Fort Collins, but I think the demographic in Fort Collins tends to still skew pretty high income, even though they do take WIC or whatever. Um, but that's that's another idea. Yeah, so I think what are the venues for attracting people and then who are the people who conduct the survey? So... Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to, I, I'm also not 100% like it has to be Chris's survey. Um, I, we, we may develop more and more different mechanisms, some to, some to be really probing like Chris's and then maybe some to be, we, we've talked about other surveys that would be more wide reaching once we have a set of things we want to examine. But I think another Thing to think about is who who's actually the touch point who's the face right in order to to not um not make people feel like it's 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 not for them there's too many negatives there but uh but i i think that who how it, how it's presented gives people an impression right Stacey, you put Ollie in the chat. That's it. It's a store. They're selling air conditioners now. Oh, it's a store. Maybe it's not out there. It's like a super discount store. Huh. And so they get lots of seasonal goods. Anyway, random, totally random thought was just, you know, when you were talking about who's buying window air conditioner units. Uh, you know, low prices, you know, we've got seasonal huh. discount stores that do carry products, you know. So we could put a booth outside like a Girl yeah. Scout cookie booth. <laughs> Girl Scout cookie booth. <laughs> Whoever's got a big box walking out. <laughs> yeah, and I think, so I think in terms of representative, this, this would not be representative but we're not representative yet like chris's interviews are not representative they're just they're, they're a way of hearing pieces from people that need to be investigated and then you can go with the do the hard work with the bigger survey 
well, that is hard work too, but I, th I think the getting the nuggets that need to be investigated can't be representative, but, but we need to tap more people somehow. Okay, so what's next on this? What is the what is the action? I'm is it is it maybe I don't know, maybe coming up with a list of or we have we have ideas of things to try. What what's the next step rather than just saying, okay, these are fun ideas, let's try some of them, right? Like we can't try everything, but can we try promising things? And then I guess it's all very well to say, oh, it doesn't have to be Chris's interviews, but that is the mechanism that we have right now. And so would that be the thing to do, Chris? Do you think next, like if we could tap a totally different population, would it, do you think the a, a promising thing to do would be um, attempt to interview those those individuals with with the script that you already have. Yeah, I think that's. Um, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, I do think that's a a possibility. Um, I think if we talk to um, Ryan about um, what. I mean, well, I guess one avenue we could take more quickly would be to just use the addresses where we know public assistance was given from this last batch that of addresses that Ryan provided. Send Do you out. have that information, or is uh, it is it by census? tracked or something where you know public assistance goes to that or do you actually have the address i i believe with the addresses that ryan provided me with to send a letter to in this last batch i had sort of stopped a quarter quarter of the way through and what i noticed is that the the remaining addresses uh, some of them included people who had received um, assistance so i could is that is that public knowledge I mean, Ryan needs Ryan to. Ryan would know better, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, I'd, I would hope not, right? But. Well, it yeah, like I said, it seems to me like, uh, and maybe maybe it wasn't Pueblo Housing Authority. It could have been the health department, but mm. somehow it shows up in the data that, um, that they were involved and they used a particular contractor to perform the work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it's implied that that those indiv those residents went through a program. Mm -hmm. But uh, he would know better. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe a couple of things to pursue um, is, is, is that that idea. So trying to ensure that the interviews get people who in some way are income qualified. And then an, maybe another one to do is like, let's let's just try or, or continue talking about finding how to find and interview individuals who have not gone through the process. So it's gonna be some other mechanism, um, you know, sitting outside the Ollie store or um yeah you may know pueblo better than any anyone i mean i'm sure you know pueblo better than anyone chris but maybe talking to the health department people about how would we find those individuals or are there organizations that assist those individuals
And the idea for now is to expand this to still just the Pueblo area. Sorry, that's not an expansion, but to try and get a more representative sample among the Pueblo population. For me, I think that's the idea. Um, I'm, I don't feel like we need to limit it to Pueblo, but I think there are some practicalities that we already don't know how to reach those individuals, right? And so attempting to do the hard thing in an area we already know can can allow us to, to work out some of the procedures that we would need to go through, right? Like if we just take a national scale and say, yeah, let's try to find all the people that that's so diffuse that I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure it would be successful in the first step, but then it, it, once we work out like, yeah, the farmer's work market works really well, or the, the box store works really well, then it's something that could be expanded. Does that make sense? And I would say, Stacy, because you're so connected with programs, anything that you find out about what people have done that works is is really helpful like i'm not i'm not going to put together a best practices guide because i think that that those don't typically get adopted as practices but we could have a list of suggestions at least like tried this this is what happened so another thing so like sometimes again it's sort of like locality specific um, there are like neighborhood associations and sometimes neighborhood associations will have something like an annual meeting again it's a timing thing so it's hard but sometimes you know during like an annual meeting they're actually designed for having or can have different booths or different information mm. from local community leaders they do a good job of inviting everybody from that neighborhood to come and kind of learn more about issues that are facing their community. Mm. Those are again, like other type of ways to meet folks, have conversations around mm -hmm. energy, energy efficiency, transitions. Mm -hmm. um, if I were designing a project in Urbana, I would definitely do that. So there's like an Urbana neighborhood There's a neighborhood association that I'm part of that does a mm -hmm. once a year meeting at a church. It draws a couple hundred people. So like I would certainly be thinking, you know, about how how to attend a meeting in that in that vein. But then mm -hmm. also recognizing that like that population that shows up is going to be of a particular demographic. And then we have in neighborhood as well. I, I mean, Tammy, I think you know it, right? Like the salt and light store. So that draws a totally, you know, a totally different demographic mm -hmm. from the area. So just kind of thinking about what what is the kind of demographic that you are looking to target, and then mm -hmm. I could probably help brainstorm if press mm -hmm. needed help. Probably not though. Like you know, how can we think about where are people showing up in mm -hmm. um in Pueblo for different for different services or service types that would broaden the diversity of the um respondent pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well I think we're at time and I didn't end early today, but I think this is a this is a tough nut. I think a lot of people struggle with it. So thanks everyone for for thinking about it. Okay, if you have things that you want to talk about, put them on the agenda. I'm gonna start filling out the agenda too, but I don't I don't, I don't want to crowd people out if you want to talk about stuff. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you.